I am a female writer, and what's interesting about the wizarding world is when you take physical strength out of the equation, um, a woman can fight just the same as a man can fight. A woman can do magic just as powerfully as a man can do magic. And I consider that I've written a lot of uh, well-rounded female characters in these books. As an author, none of the women ever gave me trouble, actually. It was always the men that gave me trouble, never the women. But Harry came to me as Harry, and I never wanted to change that. Because switching gender isn't simply putting a dress and a, and a pretty name on, on a boy, is it? Um, a lot of preoccupations and, ex and ex expectations are different on, on men and women, and so the books would have been incredibly different, I think. Considering the protagonist is a male, I don't think it was so obvious at the beginning that she very much wanted to portray her female characters as very strong-willed and sort of admirable. But as the films went on, I think you can really see it. It's interesting for me with Harry because throughout the series, he is so much a boy in search of a father. And yet, at these times of real stress, it's his mother that's a place of refuge. And I think that um, it's not very hard to see the reason why. My mother died six months into the writing of Harry Potter, and I became a mother to a daughter. So I just suppose that as a woman and as a daughter, maybe I feel that that's a form of love that doesn't get explored as much as it should do, given that it's in every, well, it's so formative in everyone's life, for good or for ill. Funnily enough, I, f I founded a charity called Lumos which is about institutionalised children, largely in Eastern Europe. And some of the many disturbing things I found out from, from being involved closely with that charity is how much measur measurable brain damage is done when a child is taken from its mother and placed in an institution. And when I say measurable, you can scan the brain and you will see that pathways haven't been made and you can never get that back. So, in fact, what I wrote about Harry having been incredibly loved in his earliest days is measurably true. That will literally have given him protection that no one can undo. His brain will have developed in a way that Voldemort's brain didn't, because Voldemort was, from the moment of his birth, institutionalised. So I suppose, yeah, Lily was representative of safety in a way that a father couldn't be because he's constantly told you look just like your father, he's got to live up to the expectations of his father, his father, his father. But Lily is something different. Lily's the person who stood by the cot and tried to stop her baby dying. Harry, Mama loves you. Harry, be safe. So yes, mother love is hugely important in the books. Fred, you next. He's not Fred, I am. Honestly, woman, you call yourself our mother. Oh, I'm sorry, George. I just think it's so cool that Joe has Mrs. Weasley and really kind of like pays homage to this incredible mother figure and how, she, how key her role is in keeping that family together, to her taking care of Harry and, you know, the whole of Dumbledore's army, really. Thank goodness you two are all right. Apart from the three main characters, of course, um, um, Harry and Ron and Hermione, Mrs. Weasley is the greatest force for good, I think, in it. She's the mother of that world. And I think that is a very female. Yes! What impressed me with Julie was you always had the sense, I felt, that this wasn't just this warm and cosy 1950s housewife pottering around her kitchen. There was some real steel in there. Now, you could say there would have to be steel in the woman who raised Fred and George, otherwise you would go start staring mad. However, it was totally plausible for me when she stepped forward in the Great Hall and thought, right, you bitch, you're getting yours. And you thought, yeah, she is about to get hers. <laughs> Bellatrix messed with the wrong woman. Not my daughter, you bitch. <laughs> it comes from her womb, that, that feeling of defence, defending her a child. She's already lost one. So it's the mother, you know, the lion, the, the female lion or tiger defending her babies, you know. So it's unstoppable, which is wonderful. Because that's good, because it's a mother really going for yeah, it, yeah. which is great. I doubt if that probably would have taken place had it been a man writing it. I really enjoyed killing 
Bellatrix, and I really enjoyed having it be Molly that did it. And of course, you also have two very different kinds of female energy. They're pitted against each other. You have Molly, who will mother the whole world if she can, and you have Bellatrix, whose idea of love is very perverse and twisted, and that was satisfying. But there was something else I wanted to do with the way that Bellatrix ended. And this was very important to me. Very early on in writing the series, I remember a female journalist saying to me that Mrs. Weasley said, well, you know, she's just a mother. And I was absolutely incensed by that comment. Now, I, I consider myself to be a feminist, and I'd always wanted to show that just because a woman has made a choice, a free choice, to say, well, I'm going to raise my family, and that's going to be my choice. I may go back to a career, I may have a career part-time, but that's my choice. Doesn't mean that that's all she can do. And as, as we proved there in that little battle, Molly Weasley comes out and proves herself the equal of any warrior on that battlefield. <laughs> and I also loved that Professor McGonagall got her, her moment to really show what she could do. Pierre Totem. Locomotor! Teachers have been so repressed in how they see Hogwarts, obviously from, from its new sort of ruling, that you can see that they're just itching for, for, you know, their fight back against evil. And I love that. For Professor McGonagall, she just completely just shows what she's made of. I don't like the marginalisation of women when the, when the fighting breaks out. You know, we get to fight too. I really wanted that. In fact, there was, there was an earlier draft. Uh, um, I know there was, at one point, uh, it was Harry who took on Snape um, in that confrontation, and I really didn't want that to happen. In the book, Minerva McGonagall is the one who does it, and for me it was very important that she did that. <laughs> I felt that... Um, you know, I had a lot of fully-fledged members of the Order of the Phoenix who were female and who were fighting alongside the men, and I really needed to show some female uh, Death Eaters. And Bellatrix is the female Death Eater par excellence. Bellatrix is not a great advertisement for prison, if this is what it's done to her. But she is doing everything for Voldemort, and she follows him over the precipice like a lemming. There's an interesting thing, isn't there, about female psychopaths. They often need to meet a male counterpart to release that part of themselves, and that's how I see Bellatrix. She is the only true follower, I think, Bellatrix thinks. You know, she went to Azkaban, but she's prepared to die. So she is pretty convinced by his supremacy and his superiority and his worthiness. I mean, Voldemort clearly is her uh, idol, her obsession. He is the only person to whom she feels subservience. She has that curious um, uh, personality disorder or quirk or whatever we're going to call it, but I think he's peculiarly female, and Helena portrays that with such gusto. It's fabulous to watch. Yay! However, it's my strong feeling that of the two sisters, Narcissa and Bellatrix, Narcissa is a much more decent person. It's interesting that J.K. Rowling decided to do that. She decided that the woman that would risk her own life to save her own son understands loyalty and understands preservation of life. I think one could argue that Draco, who, who is ultimately revealed not to be an evil character, Draco got his goodness from his mother. And ultimately, I want, there's an echo of what Lily did, quite a conscious echo of what Lily did right at the start of the story, at the very end of the story. At the start of the story, Lily dies to keep her son alive. At the end of the story, Harry lies pretending to be dead on the ground, and it's her mother who saves him again because she's trying to get to her own son. So that was my, you know, that was closing a circle. He was saved there by Lily, and he's saved there by Nar Narcissa. Is he alive? Is he alive? 
I do strongly express my worldview in the books. Dead. One of the things I find most revolting in life is um, self-righteousness that covers self-interest. And that was unbridged from beginning to end. And she's, she's actually quite as sadistic as Beltrix, but under, you know, it's all justified because I work for the ministry. I'm so horrible woman. <laughs> she has this kind of like horrible double side to her, whereas the, she, on the outside she's all fluffiness and pinkness and niceness and, um, ugh. And then on the inside she's just evil, just like pure evil. Yes? Nothing. That's right. Because you know, deep down, you deserve to be punished. Don't you, Mr. Potter? I think this is just making the most of what really little power she has, but she will hang on to it and keep clearing people out as long as she can, her last breath. Power for me is a very difficult issue. I'm suspicious of people who want power, which I think comes across quite strongly in the books. But I have come to accept that if you are in a position to give, for example, a lot of money to a cause, then that gives you power because money, money can be a very powerful tool. If you, are, if you have a profile, that means you can give a voice to a cause that otherwise wouldn't have a, such a loud voice, and that is also a form of power. But for me, it's a slightly more complicated issue than that, because I think as an author, you know, I chose a career path that traditionally does not lead to a lot of power. And so I think I really am not being disingenuous when I say that any form of power that's come to me through Harry Potter was very, very unexpected. I really admire her grace. She's definitely been an inspiration and a role model. I mean, I just feel so blessed that I was given the chance to experience all of these amazing women. Here we go. Helena was also a really important mentor to me on this last movie. She very sweetly invited me over for dinner, and we talked about books a lot. And just being a woman, I feel as if somehow I have been under the microscope even slightly more than the boys, just by being the girl. You know, whether it's what I'm wearing, whether it's what I'm doing, why I'm going to school. Just in every sense, I feel as if the public is just so much harder on women. So I think we both, we both know how that feels, um, being under that kind of scrutiny. Um, you know, we talked about how to kind of be able to absorb criticism and flattery and knowing what's genuine and what isn't, and knowing who to trust and, yeah, well, I had such a good, I had, it was such a big evening for me. I don't know if she knows how kind of um, important it was for me, but I've never told her this, but after, after I had my evening with her, I went home and wrote down everything that she said, <laughs> everything that we, that we shared. And I, have, I actually have a book um, of important encounters to me, and I write down, I write down things that they say, because I was like, one day I'll really wish I remembered what that, incredible person that I met said and, and what they thought about things and I just don't I don't want to forget so Joe has a page too. To Miss Hermione Granger for the cool use of intellect while others were in grave peril. 50 points. Good job. I wouldn't say that I based any of these women on specific women that that I knew but Hermione is an exaggeration of me. So Hermione really did come from a, a very deep place inside me. I was very insecure, and um, still am quite insecure in a lot of ways, but I was a very insecure person for longer than I like to admit. And I think writing about the time in Hermione's life that I write about, growing from childhood into womanhood, literally, because she, when we finish the book, she's 18. I think it brought back to me how very difficult it is. So much is expected of you as you become a woman, and often you are asked to sacrifice parts of you in becoming a girl, I would say. Hermione doesn't. She doesn't play the game, if you like. How could I be so stupid? I checked this out weeks ago, Forbidden Light reading. 
This is light. The kind of teasing that Ron gives Hermione for being clever and always being in the library and, you know, I've, I've had that my whole life. Guys giving me a hard time for doing well and being smart, and so I can totally relate. You're saying it wrong. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. You do it then if you're so clever. Go on, go on. From the first moment that I spoke to Emma, I just thought, oh, thank Christ. I did, because, you know, who knew who they were going to cast as Hermione? I was more worried about Hermione than anyone else. I thought, you know, are you going to get a girl and put her in glasses and then she'll, you know, because that shows she's clever. I mean, how many times have we seen that happen? And I spoke to Emma on, on the phone. She was very young. I think she was 10. And I thought, you are going to be able to play a very bright, articulate girl with conviction because that's who you are. I felt like I had the most pressure in a way because if I screwed up Hermione, I would be screwing up a part of Joe and just would have been awful. I remember she sent me a letter after the third movie. She wrote me a letter and she said, to my perfect Hermione, and to hear that from the creator of her was obviously the biggest compliment I could receive, and I knew that was when I really knew that I'd done a good job. I think the three main characters work as a trio, and part of what makes it work is their gender, and I have fun with that. I have fun with that in, um, in Deathly Hallows when it's, it's three main characters alone in a tent. And Hermione says, I notice I'm the one who gets, you know, it gets to do the cooking because I'm a girl, I suppose. And Ron says, no, it's because you're, th you're the best witch and we need for with you're the best at magic. So it was, it was fun to play with that. You're amazing, you are. Always the tone of surprise. They couldn't get through a day without her. She really is, she's the brains. She's the best at spells. She's always two steps ahead. She's very much part of the action. <laughs> The main female characters aren't there as a sort of like added bonus, which I feel like so many female characters are. Even Ginny is this incredibly powerful, stubborn, intelligent, quick-witted woman. She's another kind of girl power figure. Rejecto! Obviously, as Ginny's character develops, you really see her as very independent and I think people portray female characters as very loud and chatty and needing to show their maybe sexuality and although it's not really needed. So I think that what that's what makes I think Geraldine's female characters very strong because they're a bit more naturalistic and a bit more down to earth. Shut it! Thanks. She's just true to herself no matter what. And I think that's a really important message. Even Luna, who's this very, like, airy-fairy, kind of, like, in her own world character, still has this amazing conviction in her beliefs, and she's still incredibly smart, and she's very emotionally clever. Your feet, aren't they cold? Big. Unfortunately, all my shoes have mysteriously disappeared. I suspect Nargles are behind it. The key to Luna is that she has that unbelievably rare quality of actually not giving a damn what anyone else thinks of her. Now, if we as adults say honestly how many people we've known like that, I think very many of us would say, uh, none. <laughs> and Luna's like that. She doesn't actually care. She's so comfortable with being different, she's fearless. And I find I loved writing scenes where Luna and Hermione were together because Luna and Hermione are the absolute antithesis of each other, and yet I love them both equally. What an interesting necklace. It's a charm, actually. It keeps away the nargles. It's sometimes very difficult as a woman to say, well, actually, this is who I am, and I'm not going to pretend otherwise. But that's the only way to be truly happy, so that's what I would want to say to girls particularly. Well, people still love the books, so I hope they'll maybe read them to their children and they'll read them to their children. That's every author's dream. I've had countless mothers come up to me and say, you know, just thank you so much for giving my daughter a role model. She absolutely idolizes Hermione. And I feel really privileged to have been able to play her. I would like to think that Hermione 
is a role model for girls. You see, I was a plain, and that is relevant. That, you know, th that is relevant. That's not a trivial thing when you're a kid. I was a very plain, bookish, freckly, bright little girl. I was a massive bookworm. And I spent a significant part of my reading looking for people like me. Now, I, I didn't come up with nothing, you know. Uh, I remember Jo March, who had a temper and wanted to be a writer, so that was a lifeline. Uh, there's a heroine in a book called The Little White Horse that I've spoken about publicly who was plain and that was, that was fabulous. Wow, you get to be a heroine and you get not to be a raving beauty. Um, but, but, you know, these were pretty slim pickings. And then in creating Hermione, I felt I created a girl who was a heroine, but she wasn't sexy. Nor was she the um, girl in glasses who's entirely sexless. Do you know what I mean? She's a real girl. She's a girl. She, she's, she fancies Ron, but she, her hopes initially are pretty, <laughs> pretty low. And she's a real girl, but she, but she never compromises on being a smart girl. She never compromises in, in, in acting dumb. She never tries to make Ron feel better by pretending to be less than she is, which is why they don't get together a lot sooner. That's the reality of life. But I'm proud of Hermione. She is who she is. Um, and if that, you know, if that, if that spoke to, um, to girls like me, then of course I'm hugely, hugely proud of her. That's what it's all about. I was always the brains and the, you know, the bossy one when I was a kid, so it's freed us all. It really has. <laughs>